Hi, and welcome to the first annual Wilson High School Truth Be Told Story Slam Contest. I'm Cassie Lonsis, the media specialist here at Wilson High School. Thank you storytellers, judges, teachers, and all students who came out to support our storytellers today. S storytellers or slammers will have five minutes each to tell a real, true, and original story about something happened to them based on this year's theme, Trouble. We will call storytellers up as we go. They will hear a warning tone at four minutes and another tone at five minutes. At the end, the judges will have the responsibility of assigning first through third places. Our first place winner will have the opportunity to move on and represent Wilson at the Truth Be Told Citywide Story Slam on Thursday, March 1st. So before we begin, let's just all take out our phones. And this is something I like to do. Um, Sorry. Okay. Let's all turn on our flashlights and just offer some lights of support for everyone. I'm sorry, but I have to put the That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and now that we all have our phones out, let's take a minute and turn our ringers and vibrators completely off. Um, since we are recording, we want to make sure that no sound is picked up while people are telling their stories. So it takes a lot of courage to get up here in front of all of you and a camera to tell your stories. So let's make sure that we're all attentive and supportive for each storyteller that comes up. And before we begin, I just wanted to extend a special thanks to Joy Root, who's given a lot of time both inside and outside of her classroom to support the Story Slam here at Wilson. So now I would like to introduce our judges. They are Courtney Hammeister. She is a columnist, a playwright, and a screenwriter whose projects have included co-writing the web series, The Benefits of Gusbandry, and the satirical stage adaptations, Roadhouse the Play, and Lost Boys Live. She also created the storytelling series and Seed, which was the host and head writer for the nationally syndicated radio show Livewire for a decade. And next, we have Amy Winato, who's the author of a memoir, Siesta Lane, and two poetry collections. Amy has been a recipient of both a Literary Arts Fellowship for her poetry and a Walden residency for her prose. She teaches writing here at Wilson through the Literary Arts, Multnomah Arts Center, Fish Trap, and at the Brighton Bush Retreat Center, as well as at Portland State University. And last but not least, we have Julie McMillan, who is the new teacher librarian at Robert Gray Middle School and Beaumont Middle School. She loves books and stories. She has a Bachelor's of Arts in Biology and Chemistry and a Master's in Instructional Technology and Library Administration. She loves stories because she is always impressed with students that are able to move her from one spot to another in five minutes, and she always comes away with every student's story with a different perspective. So now, without further ado, um, let's hear from our first storyteller, Shoo. Oh, sorry. What you I'm sorry, I forgot we had a slight schedule change. Um, the first storyteller is actually Indigo Paris. <laughs> so, I'm not sure if you all know this, but painful things hurt. Yeah, they're pretty painful. And this is how I've encountered it a lot of the times, when I have sore calves, when things start shaking and trembling, when people get divorced and your friends are crying and your heart is breaking and things all seem to be going wrong because you're struggling, it hurts. And it did that same day when I thought that everything hurt, when I broke. And then I realized after this incident that just because something hurts doesn't mean it's bad. Just because I struggle through something doesn't mean that I can't grow from it. And on this day I learned something about struggles and something about my problems is that they aren't really my problems. Let me show you what it's like. It was a few weeks ago, actually a few months ago, and I was a part of this dance troupe. 
So just imagine this, you see stage lights and glitter and paint being thrown and doors swinging and people kicking in turns and flips. It's, it's all the glamour that I like, at least. And it's fun. It's awesome. Except when your whole team that you're a part of is a part of something else as well. They've been friends since before you got there, since five. So you, you're part of this, but not really. You know, you're, they're kind of like a wolf pack, and you're like a dog who's like running beside them, trying to, trying to be a part of it. But it's difficult. But you're there. You're part of the pack. And you're twirling beside them, you're running beside them. But then the stage lights go out, and you're backstage. And that's where I found myself, backstage, in the dark, and there's an aisle, and then I hear voices ahead. And all I'm thinking is, okay, prepare yourself, final act, this is it, this is the last one. And um, there's no one on your side of the stage, on my side of the stage. So I'm looking around, and there's an empty chair here, and I know I have some time before my next number. So I look back up to the voices that are around the corner, and I'm like, go by the voices, Indigo. Go by the voices, be a part of the pack. So I do, and I turn the corner, and I'm going there, and the one, the one guy on our team looks at me, and I, d I don't hear what he says, because it's just a silhouette, and you just see an arm come up, and it's something like, dum, 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 over there. And my brain heard that as, they need you over there. And I was like, they need me? Okay, if they really need me. Um, and some part of me, of course, is like, I don't know if they need me. You know, I'm indigo. I'm the, I'm the dog in the pack. I'm not a wolf. So uh, anyway, I turn around, and I'm running backwards, and I look back to the two empty chairs. And I'm like, okay, still empty, but there's a side door. And I scooch my hip into that side door, and I look out and down the hallway, and it's just empty, just empty cement walls. I'm like, who needs me? Not them. So I, so I turn back around. Anyway, I'm back to the silhouette, and I come up right next to him, and I'm say, I say, what? And then he, I, he comes right into my face, and it was so sudden that I felt myself step back, and I was like, whoa, okay. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, who needs me? And he says, what are you talking about? I need you to get out of our way. I said, oh. And I turned back around. And I sat down in the chair for a second and said, they don't need me. Am I alone? And I pushed open the hallway and I sat down there in the hallway that was empty and heard it not become so empty with my own voice of sobs and whatnot. And I realized that that was painful. That was really painful to not be a part of something, to have this struggle. And Struggles are like that. They'll disguise themselves like that. They'll be painful, they'll hurt, and you'll think that it's a problem. It's bad, I don't wanna be part of it. But you know what I did after that? I got off that wall. I went back into that theater and I finished that dance. Because struggles aren't blocks. They aren't problems. They aren't these bad things that we should avoid. They're opportunities. And that was what I discovered that day. Struggles are opportunities to be better people. Thank you. All right, thank you, Indigo. And next up, we have um, Shu Jantz. So, I was walking down the street, right, with my friend. She's absolutely gorgeous. And a man complimented us on that. Mo she more than I, but it still made me question how people perceive me. You know, they first see me and they're like, wow, you're really Asian. Like, I mean, it's even my family, they're white, you know. Um, I once said, like, my grandmother was like, your eyes are quite exotic. And I was like, thank you, they belong to, like, more than half of the population. Uh, which is also ironic because they say <laughs> we're not packing heat. Um, but no, really, no matter how extroverted I try to be, I'm quite introverted, quite quiet. And, you know, not quiet as in don't mind him. He'll just cause a distraction. He'll just start crying 
quiet as in when he gets upset he'll just break things because I am a very emotional person and I don't know how but my parents when I broke something they would always run upstairs to check if the paint job is okay if anything is broken and if like they could silence this car alarm that's going on and I don't know how, how they ever did it but they did and it was mostly my mom who has always been there for me and I never really appreciated that. Imagine walking home after a long day at school, trying to socialize with a friend for six hours who somehow mislaid you, but said sorry, so it was fine. And you come across a woman who has been there for 15 years. And there are those kind of fights that are fixed with butterfly kisses and being held in arms that are your sanctuary. And then there are those that start with, get up, do something, at least try. We've established from a very early age that breaking things is unacceptable. Then why couldn't I tell that my mom feels social anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts? But the thing is, she won't break. She is a strong warrior that has suffered so much from, you know, teenage years, which I'm dealing with now, and now the absence of a person who said, I love you for more than 10 years every single day. It just shows that, you know, we're all our own people, and we all suffer our own tr troubles. Thank you. All right, and next up we have Marina McLean. <laughs> Marina McLean doesn't do trouble. When it's when she's in a store and they say we're closing soon, so everyone leave as soon as possible. She gets nervous if she's not leaving as fast as possible because that's technically kind of breaking the rules. So it's really weird that Marina McLean, which is me if you haven't picked up on that, is best friends with Nathaniel Davis, a skinny, short Jewish boy with sunglasses and a leather jacket who has a propensity to convince teachers of things that they shouldn't be doing. On this particular day, he's managed to convince the art teacher that it's normal for us to go outside with a bunch of spray paint cans and do an art project on something. <laughs> a normal conversation between Nathaniel and Marina goes something like this. Do you think I could climb that fence? I don't know, it looks pretty dangerous. But do you think I could climb it? Uh, Maybe? Do you dare me to climb it? Yeah. <laughs> so Nathaniel climbs the fence, and he's about all the way at the top of this fence. On the other side is a rich of this fence. It is a rich-looking house, and a rich-looking man with a face redder than his shirt pops out of the window, and he says, You darn kids, get off my fence! And I would have had some kind of smart, sassy retort to this if it weren't for the words he says next. If you don't get off my fence, I'm calling the police. Marina McLean doesn't do trouble, and she definitely doesn't do police. Nathaniel and I scramble off of the fence and run towards the nearest school door. We have got to get out of here, but just our luck, it's locked. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Don't look now, says Nathaniel. But everything just got a lot worse. So the police are there. Um, and they're questioning the man in the rich looking house. Oh no, this can't be happening. 
Marina the do-gooder is freaking out. Don't worry, don't worry. Oh no, Marina and Nathaniel duck behind one of the cars as time stops and a police officer walks right next to them. Coast is clear, he says into his walkie-talkie. Nobody out here. Let's try another sector. What are we going to do? I say to Nathaniel. This might be an average day for him, but this is the craziest thing that has ever happened to me. Well, we've got to wait until one of the doors opens, he says. Um, when's the next time a door will open? Me. When school lets out? Nathaniel, but that's not for another three hours. Me, then I guess we're gonna have to wait. Three hours. Three hours of dodging police, hiding behind cars, and running around. The air smells toxic. I don't know if it's just my mind, but this is the craziest thing as <laughs> I feel like a top-tier criminal as I duck and hide and somersault on the ground, <laughs> running for my life. Finally, the school bell rings and the floodgates open, students pouring out, and the teacher says, where have you guys been this whole time? We've been looking all over for you. Nathaniel, uh, you know, we were around. Uh, the teacher, it's a good thing you weren't outside because... There's a toxic gas in the air. We haven't been allowed to um, let anyone outside this whole time. If anyone is outside and breathes in this deadly gas, they could actually die and get sent to the hospital. <sighs> now Marina McLean is a little bit more troublesome, but let's just say she doesn't hang out with Nathaniel anymore. Thank you. And next up, we have Madeline Moore. Okay. The trouble with anger is that it affects others far more than it affects you. The gravest mistakes are often committed in fits of fury. Anger, that fiery feeling that's so filling and overwhelming and just seems to keep going and going. We all have anger, and it comes in three different colors. Red anger is passion, hatred, and frustration. Black anger is violence. This is the kind that is in killers. It is the release of composure and envelops and controls your body for you. The third anger is blue anger. Blue anger has a cold burn and does not physically harm those around you, but will torment their minds for the rest of their lives if you give in. I once had blue anger. Blue anger does not just come all at once. It builds up over days, weeks, months, even years. You add to blue anger more than anyone else does. By this I mean, you take all of the hurts of the world and you sit in them. You allow them to become flaws you see in yourself. You add to blue anger each time you linger upon what upsets you. Blue anger is a starving monster that is eager for you to feed it. I fed mine with jealousy, self-pity, and isolation. My jealousy was what sparked the blue flames. I believe my parents treated my sister better and that my friend's parents allowed them to do fun things that I could not. My self-pity was the log thrown atop the tinder. I sat in my jealousy and let everything I disliked become the focus of my day. And finally, I isolated myself. That was the gasoline added to the inferno. We had an argument. I didn't do the dishes. I did most of the dishes. Shouldn't that be enough? You called me selfish. I let you. I was jealous my sister hadn't gotten yelled at, too. I pitied myself, and finally, 
I isolated myself. I went to my room. You took my phone. I slammed the door and sat alone. Alone I dwelt, kindling my blue flames. The fire grew, and I was burning. Everything was burning. I went outside. You were asleep. How do I extinguish this fire? I asked myself, for it had been growing for so long it could not be put out with mere floods of blood. I ran to the street. I could see the headlights. I could hear the screeching tires and feel the metal grill as it collides with my torso. Then there's a man screaming and crying. No, not the street. No one should do my dirty work for me, I thought. The burning blue blaze spikes, and I must find relief. Must find relief. I'm sprinting now, turning corners and crossing streets, until suddenly I see it. The perfect place. The perfect way. I'm ascending the cement steps now. My leg is over the rail, and I'm standing, leaning away from the bridge to stare down at the road below. I imagine myself as the figurehead at the front of a ship, like one of the beautiful mermaids that clings to the wood behind her to gaze into the nothingness of the sea. I can hear my heart beating and every breath I take and the crackling of the blue flames. I'm about to let go when I realize this may put out my painful pyre, but it could start a fire in other people. I let go and I fell to the ground where I sat and sat and sat. The stars winking down at me even as the street lamps glare up and I'm caught in a twilight zone between the earth and the sky. It's been hours. I still don't know how to calm these fires. There are shouts. I look down. My sister, screaming my name. My fire vanishes from the crashing waterfall of my younger sister's voice. I'm coming down the stairs, my bare feet scraping the pavement. I'm nearly thrown to the ground as she embraces me. My shoulder dampens as she cries and hugs me. She's shuddering so hard I have to hold her up. She looks into me and she trembles out. I thought you ran away. I look down and tell her I would never. And as we walked back together, I understood my anger would have changed her. I once had blue anger and my anger put me and those I love in danger. And I knew I had to change for her. It was not easy and of course I still get mad. But now my fire's out, I can see both the good and the bad. Next up, we have Mohammed Taylor. <clears throat> okay, so my story takes place about when I was in fourth grade. I was uh, just a little kid. I was curious, like a lot of most kids at that time. And uh, one day, I was visiting my grandma, and I was just uh, on the computer on, on Facebook. I don't know why I had a Facebook at fourth grade, but I was on it just playing around, playing some games. And for some reason, this thought just came to me. Now, there was this toothpick just sitting right next to me, and then there was also a lamp like lighting up the entire room. So I thought it'd be cool if I held up the toothpick to the lamp, try to set it on fire, and I could just play with it like a little toy or whatever. So I get this idea and I try doing it. It's been a few minutes, the toothpick isn't lighting on fire, and my hand's like starting to get hurt, which I guess should have been like a warning sign for me to maybe not do this. This isn't a good idea. But I keep going and I get a paper towel and I wrap my hand in it to try to do it again to protect my hand from the fire, well, you know, from the light. So I put it up to it. A few seconds later, about 10, 20 seconds, I, look, I see a little bit of smoking, but I keep going on anyway because, you know, this is kind of cool. I'm about to light this toothpick on fire, but it wasn't the toothpick that got lit up. It was the uh, paper towel that was currently wrapped around my hand. So as I look at the fire start to spread across the paper towel, I'm just like in shock and awe because, one, I kind of got something on fire, and that's pretty cool for a fourth grader. But two, there's a fire in the house and, you know, I could potentially hurt a bunch of people. So my brother's also there. We're both running around screaming because there's like a fire in my hands right now, paper towel. We don't really know what to do. And I'm just running around. It gets hot, so I drop it. So now my hands aren't hot anymore. But now the carpet's on fire. So we're freaking out even more. 
So I tell my brother, like, fill up a like water bottle or something to put it on the fire to put it out. But he's just still screaming and running around, not knowing what to do. So we're all freaking out. We're like little kids. We don't want to like go to jail, like burn to death or something. So then I fill it up myself. I put it onto the fire. The fire goes out after like a few times. And everything's all right until I notice a giant black crater of charcoal and burnt carpet. So then I'm freaking out. I get on my hands and knees, get some soap and water, think, hoping that I can wash it away. Then I just asked my brother to help me, and he just kind of like just steps back and just goes in the other room and just says that he's not going to get in trouble for something I did. So I'm just basically on my own here. And while I'm just crying, trying to put out the you know, smoldering carpet, my cousin just walks in and is just like, I heard screaming and I smelled smoke, what's going on? So he just sees me you know, trying to clean up the carpet, even though you know, I couldn't do it. And he just kind of smiles a little and was like, y you can't get that out. It's like, I'm going back to bed. It just, just, just leaves me there to try to do it on my own. So I'm freaking out because my dad's going to come back soon to pick me up. And he's going to be really mad. My grandma wakes up. She just looks at me. She gets kind of worried because she knows, you know, that my dad's going to spank me pretty hard for what I just did because I burnt the carpet and I could have hurt people. So she just tells me to go in her room. I lie on the floor next to her bed, you know, pretend to go to sleep. And then I hear a knock on the door. My dad walks in. He starts screaming because giant black crater again. He goes in the room. He sees me pretending to be asleep, yells at me. And my grandma tries to convince him that I'm totally asleep. There's nothing, you know, I can't, she can't do anything right now. I'm asleep. But then he can just hear me like trying to quietly cry under there as he's screaming and yelling. So then, you know, he gets me, I get up, we go home. He spanks me really, really hard. I feel really bad about it to this day. You know, burn the carpet and all. It's still there, even though, like, we moved out. I'm not sure what they really did with it, but, you know, I guess it's still there for the other people to see it. And uh, I never played with fire again. You know, it's a lesson that you should have learned, you know, from your, like, a little kid, you know. Like, the cavemen did it, and, you know, we shouldn't do it now. So, yeah, never played with fire until I learned to get matches on my own. And last but not least, we have Vivian Weinstein. There was once a time this past summer, kind of mid-July-ish, where I was hanging out with my friend. We decided to bust to Dairy Queen and have a good old time. While we were chowing down on our nugs, having a blast at the DQ, dipping it, smothering it, and all the good sauces, my in particular favorite was ranch, the bomb. I, I really suggest it, actually. But while we were there, she started bringing up things to me that she was bringing up about her past and current things. And one of those things that she brought up was stealing. And so that was the day I got caught up in a large annoyance slash um, being threatened to be called by the police. So. Um, we decided to go to Lamb's Thriftway, which was right across the street. We walked in, we're having a great old time, and I just thought we were going in to get some snacks. That was not the case. <laughs> we go in, just taking some nice steps, when she says, cover for me, when we're in the medical section. Of course you'd think, oh, this girl's gonna snag some like cough syrup, stuff that could probably potentially get us in more trouble. But no, she decides to grab Hello Kitty Band-Aids. Oh turns to me and says, please cover for me. I say, this is your decision. And she says, okay, and stuffs them in her bag. In the, not even nonchalantly, this girl doesn't even do it nonchalantly. She's just like stuffing it so hard in her bag that, that anybody on camera or even in public right next to her, like I could, could clearly see. Right after this, a man approaches us and asks us, asks us what the day is. He's a little husky, has a bit of a stubble. You know, he's just wondering what the day is. I say it's July something. I don't remember what the exact date was because I'm not that brainy. You know, so. <laughs> um, we just thought some dude asking what the date was. We passed that, passed it along. I said, I want to buy myself some natural Cheetos. I'm not here to steal. Like, I just, I just want to buy some food and get out, please. Like, so I maneuver my way around the store, trying 
to distract myself from what's going on. And as we're leaving the store now, she, she says that it would be sketchy for me to buy Cheetos. And I still said, it's your decision. Are you sure you're making the right choice? But she doesn't listen to me, so yeah. <laughs> We continue to exit the store. She steals a bouncy ball and bounces it out the door. And the same guy who asked us what the date was says, stop right there. You're coming back inside with me. I now give her the harshest glare I've ever given her in my entire life. It looked a little something like this. I was pissed, furious, fuming. As we're walking in, we get pulled along the little side thing. He asks for my ID, I give it to him. And I say, my name's Vivian Weinstein and I go to Wilson High School, I'm a sophomore. And so we are running in, I'm freaking out, and she's just terrified of me at this point because of that nasty glare I gave her and just how mad I was that she didn't listen to me. And as we're going in, she tries texting me, I'm sorry, and I just, leave her on red even though we're right in front of each other. I love life. This is, this is what we're going through right now. Texting somebody, texting me back right in front of each other. So that happened and after that, her parents had to make the drive of shame over to pick up their child who had stolen a pack of Hello Kitty Band-Aids, a bouncy rubber ball, and without my knowledge, a Burt's Bees lip balm, which altogether came up to 825 and her parents had to pay a $200 fee for her, pay, for her stealing all of those things and didn't get away with it. The guy let us go off with a warning and I tried to be funny and make jokes and make things lighthearted. I was like, oh, I was her accomplice. <laughs> and and the, the manager said, please do not say that. And that, that made me feel really, really good <laughs> trying to lighten things up and that was okay. But in the long run, I didn't talk to her for about a couple weeks just trying to chill out and I'm still to this day not allowed to go in there until I'm 18 or without parental supervision. So um, uh, my lesson is that I, I simply can't trust people who don't listen to me. So. <laughs> All right, if we could have all of our storytellers come up for one more round of applause. Come on up. You all did an amazing job. Um, so we're going to take a quick break to confer with the judges and then we'll let you know who won first, second, and third prize. All right, if we could have our student storytellers come up one final time. And I'd like to present each one of you with a journal um, to continue your writing and enjoy recording your thoughts. All right. Yeah, oh, wait, stay up here. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you back here. All right. And so now to announce the winners. Um, so third prize goes to Marina McLean. And second prize goes to Madeline Moore. And first prize goes to Vivian Weinstein. So congratulations. Um, I think you all did a phenomenal job. And hope you all have a great day. <laughs>